John Turturro joins me in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Hi, this is sort of an out-of-body experience. I mean, you talk <laughs> about the film, I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> it actually uh, happened, yeah. <laughs> yes, it did. Yes. And, and it's a great pleasure to have you here. Congratulations you. on the world premiere. Thank you. Out of body or not. Uh, one of the identifiable hallmarks of this film, and famously of many Woody, Woody Allen films, is, is how it situates the story, the characters, even the audience in New York City. And the story of how you and Woody Allen came together is a very New York story. Can you tell it? Uh, basically, you know, we share a, a hair cutter or a barber. Uh, uh, I think he preferred to be called a hair cutter, Anthony <laughs> Silvestri. And uh, I was came up with this idea over lunch with a friend of mine, and then I got my hair cut and I shared it with Anthony. And uh, I guess Anthony then cut Woody's hair, and they were talking, and... Uh, Anthony shared this idea. I, I didn't ask him to with Woody, and Woody thought it was a really good idea and told Anthony to call me, and then I I, I got a call from Anthony. and I, From said, the barber. The from bar the barber. The he barber said, was the broker. Good news. He said, good news. <laughs> Woody loves your idea, and I was like, wow, I can't even believe that you, you, know, you, you shared this with him, and then I had to go set up an appointment with Woody and sit there. And I really didn't have a script. I had some ideas. You guys don't know each other before We know, this. yes. We, you, yes. You we, did. we had worked together in Hannah and Her Sisters. I had right. a small part. He had asked me to be in something, and I couldn't do it. And then we did a movie with Doug McGrath, a friend, a friend of his and mine, a uh, company man, years ago. And so we know each other a little bit. But you didn't feel like you could just call him or no, you know, no, write, I didn't, write to him? No, and, you know. no. I was very, you know, shy in that way. And then... You know, so I told him the idea, and he liked it, and then he, and certain things he he liked better than others, and so he said, "Well, why don't you write it, and and then I will, uh, you know, give you my feedback and tell you if I like this or that," and that began this long process as I was doing other things. Meaning that John, while you wrote it, you you actually workshopped a little bit. With no, no, I, I would I would I would you know write it, and uh, and then I'd send him the draft, and then he'd send me an email back with all his. Merciless criticisms and uh, things that he liked or didn't like. And what was that I didn't like? really know, you know, in what direction maybe he wanted to go. If he wanted to do something very broad or something a little more sophisticated, and I, you know, he he made it very clear that he wanted to do something that wasn't silly and and that had certain you know layers to yeah. it. And uh, it was it was you know it was a little bit at first I was like whoa wow he, I guess he doesn't like this direction so. I kept thinking about what he said and uh, had other people read it too, and uh, which he encouraged me to do. And then I would would do various drafts, and he would send he'd always read it and send me a long note back. And then sometimes I'd meet with him and discuss things. And uh, eventually, in the middle of it, he asked me to direct these. He was going to do these three one act plays on Broadway, which he wrote one of them, and Elaine May did, and Ethan Cohen, mm. and he suggested me as the. Uh, sacrificial <laughs> goy uh, 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 director. And uh, anyway, I, doing that, I got to know him, very, you know, in a very different way. Yes. Uh, and then uh, continued to revise the, the script. It was getting closer. And then he eventually said, you know, hey, I like it, so why don't you see if you can get the funding? The thing is, we're not used to seeing Woody Allen appear in other people's films. Right. And, and his comic timing in Fading Gigolo is flawless, as if it's being directed by, uh, as if being directed by someone else has freed him up. Like, do you, what was your approach to uh, directing Woody Allen? Well, I know he likes to paraphrase. He told me a little bit. He said he, he will do all the, uh, the dialogue, but he kind of tries to, you know, paraphrase his way in or, or his way out. So the first day was a little. I was. I wanted to see, you know, how he was with all the lines. He had a lot, of, a lot of lines. And uh, once I saw that he could, you know, handle that, I was also acting with him. So uh, it was it was a little trial and error the first maybe hour. And then after that, everything we just kind of hit hit our flow. And and then later on, sometimes I would say, hey, you know, stick to the script more here. I, you know, want make sure you we get this line in. And he usually did. He was very prepared. Uh, but if I wanted it more delicate or a little uh, more serious or a little, uh, if I had to say something, I would. If I didn't, if I felt it was going well the way it was going, then uh, 
uh, you know, I talked to him afterwards. I said, well, how'd you feel? And he said, yeah, I felt pretty good. Not and, to take anything away from your accomplishments, but were you intimidated at any point? Well, you know, you're here, so it's, it's kind of shocking that you actually get to that point, and here he is across from you. We were in the flower store the first day, and, and you're like, wow, this is this is actually going to... <laughs> Gonna, it's going to really happen. So it takes you a little bit. We He didn't really want to rehearse with me, but because I had spent a lot of time with him in the theater and developing it, that helped a lot. And, uh, you know, it was obviously I could enjoy what he was doing, and that's what friends do. You mm. know, friends enjoy each other. That's why they're friends. And, uh, you know, I actually found it pretty easy eventually because he wanted to come to work. He, he told me, tell me wh what you want me to do. And uh, he was probably him and maybe Vanessa were like the two easiest people on the set. You know, they he just wanted to, you know, to get to work. And uh, there's a, an amazing chemistry on screen with you and Woody. It's almost like you're this old comic duo. I've been doing this for years. Are you aware of that? Did you uh, could you feel that? I could feel that we have we have you know, that was the whole idea of it was i thought maybe we'd be an interesting team because we'd be very we were very different in a way and i would be more of the straight guy you know uh, and he'd be the guy who did more of the talking but i i had this instinct that it, that, that 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 could be but you never know but uh i think there's some kind of uh you know genuine affection there and uh you know, he's older than me, and so obviously there's kind of this, you know, like could be my uncle or something like right, that right. or a mentor. Right. And uh, that's a nice experience to have at someone at my age, you know, who's, in, knock on wood, the middle of my life or whatever. Uh, but, yeah, I could I could feel that. There were times that, because sometimes I would, you know, just laugh and enjoy him, and, and I thought, well, that's really – that's that's the truth of the situation, mm. you know. And uh, yeah, we, we can feel that as the movie goer too. Yeah, and he's also he's a, he's, he's a very persuasive guy, a, in his own way. So, you know, uh, he has because he's a persuasive guy, or because he's Woody Allen. No, I think because of who he is. You know what I mean? He's he's done what he's wanted to do right. on his own terms his whole life. You know, he he never goes to like you know. Heart, uh, Award shows. He doesn't right. do a lot of, you know, publicity. He does some, but he's, he's a, he's like a worker, and he, he's not afraid to tell people, hey, this is, you know, terrible. You know, this is <laughs> not good. Or this is. L let me do that again. And uh, it was interesting watching him work with the kids. For example, they didn't. They weren't intimidated by him at all because they didn't even know who he was. And I kept telling them the hey, actual kids in the, the film. The kids yeah, yeah. in the movie. The, you know, yeah. he has this sort of surrogate. You know, these four black kids yeah, who he yeah. has and and you know he really enjoyed that and they were like you know i said this guy is you know, he's a legend you gotta you gotta treat him in a way and he would tell him he said yeah i can't work with you guys you're, you're, you're amateurs he goes yeah amateurs and they were like they would give they they gave him as much as he gave to them they uh -huh. were back and forth and it was interesting you know he's a person like anybody else but yes he is a he's a, a very strong person He's a very strong-willed person. A lot of the humor in this film comes from the fact that you are the opposite of the steely, chiseled. Maybe not the opposite. Right. I don't want to, right. but you're not the Channing Tatum type character we usually see in in the, in the role of the male sex object. Right. Uh, Fioravante is is a he's a shy middle-aged florist who's a bit intimidated by the women hiring him. Uh, is there a broader message, John, here about waning male power you wanted to explore in Fading Gigolo? Well, I also, you know, I. There was a couple things. One is that, yes, there's, you know, people at a certain age, they, they can still be sexual, you know what I mean, and still be, uh, you know, interested in, in intimacy. You know, he's a kind of character, I think, he's a guy who just doesn't like to commit, but he's actually very comfortable with women. And there are men who are very comfortable with women. There are men who like women, but th they don't really, they're not really that comfortable mm. with them, you know. And, you know, when you see movies... Sometimes you see a certain kind of guy. He's always in the position, you know, uh, you know, it's Brad Pitt or George Clooney or whatever. And I think that's fine. But I think sometimes it's it's very interesting to see a, a different kind of person in that situation who can represent a more like an everyman. You know what I mean? And and people like maybe Gene Hackman have done that or Robert Duvall or something like that. And I thought, well, that's something that, that I could do, and I'm also very comfortable with women. I've worked with a lot of women. 
uh, in movies I've directed, and uh, I have a lot of close uh, female friends. I also like women <laughs> too, uh, and I thought, you know, that's something that that's very much me. And Do you so, see yourself as an everyman? Well, I, I don't. I don't see myself as a guy who's, uh, you know, I walk into a room. And everybody is in, you know, knows who you are. Well, they they know who I am now, but you know, when you're a really, like, when you're a really beautiful person, I think you have a lot of advantages, and you have a lot of disadvantages because you immediately assume that people are interested in what you do, and if you're not uh, innately like beautiful, you could be attractive in a certain way. You know what it is to try to hold someone's attention or to listen to another person too. You don't assume that. So I thought, you know, I, I was dealing with that, also the elements of, you know, a man being not too pretty, not too beautiful, you know, a person who I have friends who are really good, who can, you know, with their hands, they can paint a house, mm-hmm. they, can, they can wire it, they can do plumbing, they can do all these things. And there's something very attractive when you, you see someone actually put something together physically, whether it's a meal or an engine or, a, mm-hmm. you know... Uh, and that kind of thing sometimes isn't recognized in a, in the modern world as much, you know, because people are always selling their wares in, in a certain yeah. way. And uh, I think there's something that's that's really seductive about that. I mean, I worked in this flower shop with all these women. They taught me how to, you know, make different kind of arrangements and things. And it was really fascinating. It was very hard work and very precise work. But... Uh, you know, it, it's, you have to have a zen-like approach because mm. any flower arrangement can be different, you know, it can be a very... Yeah. But but just to, two steps back when you're talking about, I mean, as a sidebar, as an actor, right? when you haven't been the chiseled face guy, right? Uh, I mean, you clearly, are, you know, you're a big success, you're very popular, but you, you, know, you haven't been that guy, the Brad Pitt guy. Right. Uh, what has that meant to your career? I mean, do, do, uh, do, do, do you actually like that in terms of you in, when it comes to casting or is it is it in fact true that it's the chiseled face guys that get the gigs in Hollywood and, and you have to fight harder if you're not that guy? Well, you do have to, you know, listen, sometimes a chiseled face guy wants to play the roles that you play and, and vice versa, you know. So when I've gotten to act in a lot of movies with great actresses uh, and I like working with women. Uh, I, I actually sometimes prefer it to act opposite of a woman sometimes uh, because it's it's uh, it brings out different things in you. And uh, when I get that opportunity, it's it's something that I enjoy. And I like acting with guys too, you know, but I'm I'm not as interested in doing, say, like action films and running and blowing things up and stuff like that. I've done a couple of those things. But uh, uh, I, I think there's, you know, it's not perfect on any side of, of the street. But in movies, there have been the history of movies, it's really based upon, you know, people's bone structures a lot. You know, people have learned to act who were beautiful. There were there there are actors who are innately gifted who were really beautiful, uh, but those are rare. Usually they learn to act. And then there are actors who, you know, come out of a different kind of right. school. Uh, and, you know, growing up, I liked actors that were both, you know, from Edward G. Robinson to Burt Lancaster, you know, or... Uh, I mean, Marlon Brando was was quite beautiful when he was young, and then they broke his nose, and he looked a little different. But he's, but he was really, you know, one of a kind. Right. He was one of a kind, uh, just the kind of actor that he was. But uh, you know, and everybody in movies, like you know, Woody, when he made movies when he was younger, he was always like the sex guy, you know, the, the and that's what, and in, in his own life, you know, he had his own girlfriends and whatever. And uh, I think, uh, you know, everyone's the lead in their own life. So there are different ways to tell a story. And, it, it's uh, interesting that you t- you've talked a couple of times about how much you, uh, that you like working with women and, and that it's a powerful experience for you. And, and that uh, the flip side of the way we see the roles, uh, the changing sort of place of men in your last couple of films, including this one, Fading Gigolo, is the way we see women. And whether it's Romance and Cigarettes, uh, your last film, or, or Fading Gigolo, you've created strong female characters yeah. in a way that we don't often see in Hollywood films. Tell me why that's so important for you. Well, I, I think, you know, women in many ways 
or are the dominant species. You know, men do all these things, and they create all kinds of you know wars, and they're, and they're always you know they're, they're the more aggressive of the species. And uh, you know, women are the ones who are the ones who are building things. And in a household, when you grow up, you know, it's your mother, you know, or the you know the person you fall in love with who can become. Uh, you know, a dominant influence on you. And uh, I think that, you know, women are underused in a great way, in, in, a, in a major way. Uh, and then sometimes they try to put the women in a man's position, you know, it's really, it's like a male role. But I think to explore that, there have been a lot of great filmmakers over the years, foreign, some American, uh, you know, some North American, uh, who have been fascinating fascinated with the power and, and the mystery of what it is to be a woman mm. and all the different manifestations that takes that takes form and in my film you know there's rich women there's women who who are a little cavalier there's a religious woman you know and uh you know i i wanted you know to have one to have different problems and obviously i needed to have an obstacle in a film about sex so once you bring religion in that also that gives you something to to wrestle with in in an interesting way, but it it just it interests me. I think maybe because I had a close friendship with my 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 mother, and I'm 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 also have a good friendship with my wife too. Mm. Uh, and just you know, women are fascinating because they have capacity to do so many things. And in movies, usually it's reduced to like a young girl in a situation. You know what I mean? And and my movie, this movie, you see people of a certain age who are reenacting these first yes. date scenarios. Yeah. And they're like 50 years old or 40 years old. Yeah. And these things, you know, happen to people. <laughs> yeah. But then yeah. you bring your whole life to that. Yeah. And that's not to negate it when it happens when you're 17. It, it's interesting watching... You, you, because and and knowing you as a, as a fan of yours through, through from your, through your work through the the eighties, the nineties, the last decade, there's always there seems to be this sense that we know uh, who John Turturro is, and and yet, uh, you know, oh, he's the guy who you know I know him the kind of role he plays, and then if you yet if you look at the roles you play, it's incredibly varied. You've you've played an incredibly different kinds of characters, including in this film. Uh, Fading Gigolo, which I mean, couldn't be further than some of the characters you, you, you've played in the Coen Brothers films, say, or or Spike Lee films, uh, and yet there's some unidentifiable uh, 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 glue that is you. It, it is John Turturro, and do, do you find how much do you draw from yourself to create the characters you portray? They all have to go through you, so you're the instrument you're the guitar you know uh, they have to go through you so this initially seemed to be very far away from me you know because I, I thought of it more as sort of like a samurai or a cowboy guy you know much more taciturn than than I am you know but uh, the film became more personal when I was interacting with Woody or with Vanessa or with Sharon and uh, you know uh, there's aspects of people that I know, and then there's aspects of yourself. But you have to always eventually personalize it because it has to go through you, you know. Uh, sometimes a broader thing, maybe you don't personalize as much, but you maybe you physicalize it more or something, you know. But, uh, uh, you know, it, sometimes to play a quieter character is... It, more challenging? It's more challenging. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I... Uh, I, I, it was a tricky. I actually was a tricky character to kind of, uh, you know, calibrate uh, because I didn't know exactly what was going to happen. But he's know. not zany. No, not at all. So it's it's he's a lot a more subtle. subtle he's yeah. very subtle. Like as you know, he has his feet on the ground. He's he, guarded. You were born in Brooklyn. I was born in Queens. I grew up, up, in, grew up in Queens. I grew up in Queens right? uh, your father worked in the construction trade. How how did you know you wouldn't end up following in his footsteps? Oh, my 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 father was a very expressive guy. My mother's family were all musicians. Uh, it's funny. I, you know, making movies is not that far from being on a building site. 
it's not that different. You know, there's, there's, there's especially if you're directing. You know, there's a certain amount of pressure. There's time. You have to meet the demands of the day. You're the and foreman. You're trying, yeah, yeah. And so, the dynamics are very close to what I grew up with. Uh, uh, less so maybe in the theater, but you're still kind of working towards something, building towards something. Uh, but I was always. I didn't know what I would want it to be, but I always liked movies when I was a kid. And, we, you know, when you don't have a lot of money, a lot of people fantasize through music or, or you know, films, and then later on theater when I was introduced to that. But I, uh, I didn't know that until maybe I was a teenager. You know what I mean? I was playing sports and things, and I was thinking, wow, if I was good enough, you know, I would have liked to have become a professional basketball player. So, uh, and like Woody said, he wanted to be a professional baseball player. And uh, then you find an avenue of expression, and sometimes you, you know, maybe you're telling a story to your friends, and you kind of can hold everybody's attention. Were your parents, I realized were that. Your parents supported? Yeah, they were. My father was a little worried about what was I going to do yeah. as a fallback position. So, I made sure I went to college to study because I could always, you know, I got my, I could always teach. If I, if I needed to, to do that. But, uh, you know, my mom encouraged me to, to do what I want, wanted to do, and she saw that I was serious about it. So, and uh, and they liked when they saw me, you know, do plays. This, um, um, some of the most memorable characters, I want to come back to Penny Gigolo, but I just want just to stay in what you've done, in, uh, especially in those early decades, the 80s and 90s. Uh, some of the most memorable ca- characters appear on screen, as it turns out, for a very short time. I'm thinking about Jesus and the Big Lebowski. When you were shooting those kind of scenes, do you, did you have, or do you have any idea that that character in that movie would have the lasting appeal it does? No, I mean, you know, sometimes like that, that was a character that I had done something like on stage and they had seen me do it. So I kind of knew the idea of it because they'd seen me do this play on stage and Obviously, they're friends of mine. I had done uh, a couple other movies with them. So they they told me it was his part, but it was, seemed so small. But then I realized people were talking a lot about him. And so then I came up with some ideas, and they had enough time during the day to allow me to try some different things, ideas that I had, because everything is very planned in Joel and Ethan's films. And I showed them a couple things, and I, I didn't think they were going to put it all in or whatever. But I knew... That, that with them, if they think it's if something's interesting, to go all the way with it, and they'll put it together in a really, you know, expert fashion. Uh, but no, you know, I didn't even get the big Lebowski when I first saw it. But I was very <laughs> embarrassed when I first saw the whole thing. I was like, oh my god, I can't believe I, because it, you know, it's like when you trust people, you will go further for them because you know wh- whatever. And I also knew that. It's a small thing, so you can go really. You, you people are talking about the guy. You you can go really far out. Mm. For, now, if I was in the whole thing, I would have had to calibrate it. You know, differently. you didn't get the big Lebowski when you saw it. No, I thought it was Jeff was really good, but I didn't get all the humor. <laughs> the second time, I, I got it better, yeah. and then the third time, I thought, wow, this is a really funny movie. Based on that long relationship with the Coen Brothers or or or, yeah. or Spike Lee as a director. How much do you draw on lessons you've learned watching them? Well, I worked with the, both of those guys and Redford and Francesco Rosi and uh, Peter Weir, and I've worked with a lot of great directors. And, you know, you, you see some people play music on a set. It's how you prepare. You know, it's, it's how you prepare. Uh, it, it's the atmosphere you create that, you know, it's that, you know, people are, it's, it's, it's collaborative and that it's not like you're in the army and there's not this big tension. And so you do pick up a lot of things. And because I've worked with different directors, I know what I like to do. And so sometimes you can do a simple thing like in this movie, I played music a lot you know, when people were walking or when we were dancing, but yeah. even when just people were walking down the street and to get them in the mood and uh, that some of that music I actually ha- you know have in the movie. Yeah. and. The crew likes it. Everybody likes it, and all of a sudden, people feel like, "Wow, this is, this is fun." You know, I've done movies with music, *Romance and Cigarettes* and *Passione*, the documentary I made about Neapolitan music. But uh, so there, there are little ways to make people, you know, happy, and get them open. And because I know I like that, and a lot of times when you're on a movie set, it can be very clinical and very cold. And uh, very mechanical. Mm. It's like going to a doctor's office, you know. And uh, so I try to create, 
a different kind of atmosphere. This feels like Fate and Gigolo feels like an indie film. I mean, I, it, it is, but yeah. it, but it feels like one too, be, which in, in as much as indie can mean artistic integrity, and and yeah. uh, I don't know if I like that word anymore. Is that well, well? I was thinking as much of the success of the Coen Brothers and Spike Lee have enjoyed, they still are seen as independent auteurs to some degree. Well, like, Joel and Ethan now they're part of the establishment, I think, in some ways, but they still go their own way. You know what I mean? They could go that way, but but they're they're part of it. But then they people know that they're responsible enough to let them go do their own thing. Because they've been commercially successful in that companies maybe haven't have made money, but when they haven't made a lot of money, they've gotten back their investment, you know? So, uh, uh, but- But how important they're, they're is it distinctive. to you to work outside of Hollywood, to, to keep your well, voice? I don't even to... know what, you know, to keep your voice is, is a different thing. It's like, you know, Woody, you know, he does what he wants to do. Uh, I wouldn't want to direct a movie that was just very predictable and you spent a lot of time on it. I'd rather maybe be in it or something. Uh, but I like, you know, I come from the theater and I, I like doing material that's, that's, that you, that you hear the author's voice or that it's distinctive or there's a distinctive point of view. That's the whole joy of that. I think when you see something, you say, wow, I, I, I never saw anything like this. I never saw... I never thought of it that way. Mm. Uh, uh, that's exciting. And uh, it's also inclusive because all of us have these distinctive, you know, fantasies or ideas or way of looking at something. And when you see it, there's something thrilling about that. So it's just trying to have your own voice. But you you would like to be able to reach a big, as big an audience as you possibly could. And sometimes those things do happen with some films. Why uh, don't you like the word indie? Uh, because yeah. I feel like in the, uh, in the, in a way, the original independent cinema was like John Cassavetes making his own movies. And then in, it was an alternative in the eighties. And now it's become kind of, I don't know what it is now. I, 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 you don't want to be like ghettoized. And I think, you know, I grew up in, in a certain time where, you know, the latest foreign film, a Truffaut film was just as like mainstream to me right. as, uh, you know, was when Steven Spielberg was starting or, you know, or Scorsese or somebody. And uh, I, I think people have tried to separate that so much. And, of, of course, the studios now... Make, but it is separate. Like, it, there's, it's, they make there's those giant movies. blockbusters. Yeah, that's that costs, a different, it's a different yeah. business. Yeah. It's a different, it's a different world that way. That's, that's a, that is a different... That's not the kind of... A uh, film that really uh, inspired me or turned me on to want to go into films. Right. So, although you don't mind acting in a couple of them, yeah, I mean, I didn't for many, many years because I used to make middle size, medium sized films, and those films have really disappeared. You know, it's usually really small films, right. or uh, or really big films, right. and you know, like a film like we had, we we had certain resources to shoot it. But we didn't have a lot of time. You know, we could have used an extra week or two to do it. Uh, so you have to prepare uh, more. Let me bring it back to before I let you go. Uh, back to fading gigolo, uh, John. Watching this film feels like being immersed in a neighborhood where there, there's an interconnectedness between the characters. Uh, apart from films being a work of art, how important is it to you that your films help bring people together to create community? Well, you know, I think uh, I'm not judgmental in the film. For the for the people who have money, the people who don't have money, you know, uh, the people who are religious, the people who are secular, uh, I think you know everybody, you know, has reasons to be the way they are because they grew up a certain way, and many of us live in cities that are multicultural, and uh, and, and there's a tremendous diversity ethnically. Uh, this is the world now. This is the world. The world has pushed us all together you know you you can be in a city like toronto or chicago or new york or rome or paris you know but there's plenty of these places but i i think when you try to tell a story about a specific world there's a lot of university universality to that too because you you, you should try to be specific in, in a way mm. uh and then you could say oh yeah i i I can relate to that in, in, in a different way. You know, I mean, 
the kids play baseball, the black kids play against the Hasidim, and they, the kids go, let's choose up sides, and it'll be blacks against whites. And they're like, no, 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 let's not do that, you know? <laughs> but it's like, that's like a natural thing, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And and then people say, okay, let's try to split it up and get a little more diversity here, you know? Uh, and I think that those things never hurt because we see in the problems of the world how people can divide, you know, tribally, mm-hmm. you know? You know, it's not only ethnically, religiously, also between men and women. Uh, and those things create, we see what they create when you, when you look at the front page of the paper. Fading Jiggle also feels like it's about following your heart. Why is no, that an movie, important th- theme for you right now? It's a movie about intimacy. And I think to be intimate is, is, is uh, not easy. It's not easy. It's, it, it, you're exposing yourself. So you could say, oh, I'm going to have sex with somebody, but... That doesn't mean you're going to be intimate with them. And then maybe afterwards you may be intimate with them. You say, wow, God, I, I did my animal act, and now I'm like, now what do I do? So that interests me because a lot goes on. A lot of dynamics of the world go, goes on in a bedroom and between people. Hmm. you know. And I think it's exciting when you see something that you go, oh, wow, that's... It's not pre-planned, and you, you're not three steps ahead of it. So uh, that, it's something that interests me. The audience reaction at the at the premiere here in Toronto was great. Yeah, no, they, they seem to really kind of go with it. What's the plan now with this film? Well, the plan is uh, we have some distributors, and now we have distributors who are interested in, in different territories, and then we have to, you know, hopefully sign those deals, and then then we take it out. You know, probably, it would probably be next year, you know, like spring of next year. See, this is why you should be making Transformers films, why? you know, blockbusters, because then you don't have to worry about distributor deals and things like that. Yeah, but then, you know, then then you also can lose <laughs> your inner your inner thoughts and your inner voices that go on. I mean, you know, one thing can help you do the other thing, so... Uh, but that's part of the world. That's part of anybody's world. I don't know? want you to be making Transformers no. films. I'm, I'm really happy you made this. Yeah, film. no, I'm, I'm really happy to. This to me is a real, it's a real, you know, privilege to be able to get a chance to work with all these people and to work with Woody, of course. And uh, you know, I know that he's really happy with it, and that means a lot to me. John Chatur, it's a real pr- privilege to get to work with you. Thank okay. you for this. Thanks for having me.